What's up, everyone? It's Rory from In Light the Shadows. Welcome to episode 19 this week. Uh, last week, we had Michelle Briggs. She's a psychotherapist from Westbridgeford in Nottingham, and she talked about loneliness. Um, we're, we're a bit mindful on the views on that one. It's really freaking low compared to recent episodes. We're not upset. We're not going to beg it off you, but I, I don't know. I just feel like maybe people, it's a raw thing with lockdown too at me, and people just don't want to go there. But what we want to say, we want to encourage you in love, check it out because what she had to share was some absolute nuggets and then randomly um today i found out guys that uh, this florist in lincolnshire shared it and unplugged that actual episode she said how brilliant it was and how timely it is for time like now going into this lockdown so as i say guys check that out um before we say hello to our amazing guest today i want to say to you thank you so much for all the support um we've had so much class things going off within like the shadows just uh, a week or two ago we did enlisted for the very first time uh, for the fellas that are like well, what's enlisted Roy I don't know what you're on about enlisted is an open men's chat session uh, that I just came up with an idea myself and the the enlightened boys we talked about and we partnered with Revels gym which is like a boxing weightlifting gym in Nottingham and um, man it went off like there was lads who've never met before but we just talked real um which is our mantra is real talk real men and um we had a laugh as well and i think that's the key fellas is that when we see mental health and we see these things we think ah oh, it's awkward i don't want to go there or you think it's going to be like a dead thing well within like the shadows it ain't that way i make sure that we have a laugh but we actually do the business where we have to open up i know we don't want to do it but it always helps um so yeah fellas it's locked down to i don't want to bore you too much with it but no time is more important than times like now and so our guest that we brought on today is um what i like about this guest is he's been there he's done that and he's seen it but what what i love is his humility he um isn't afraid to be vulnerable and what you see with a lot of people um where the cameras are on them or you know like with him he's a professional athlete they kind of tend to like keep private things private and that is absolutely understandable and most of the time true but this fella has just got proper vulnerable in the last couple of years talking about his mental health journey. And I just thought we're blessed as in Lightning the Shadows to have him on episode 19 today. Uh, so without further ado, Sam Oldham is with us. Um, Sam, mate, how are you doing, bud? I'm very well, thank you, my friend. I'm very well. Just getting ready for the uh, lockdown 2.0 like yourself. Oh, no. um, yeah, I'm happy to be here, man. <laughs> happy to be here. Happy to be on the show and hopefully we'll, uh, we'll get into it. Yeah, man, it should be a corker. And uh, fellas, if you can hear the bangs in the background, obviously people are, are that bored. They're just setting off fireworks left, right and centre. But yeah, in fact, I'm going to tell you a funny story, uh, Sam, and for our viewers. Um, I, I don't like to mix my work into In Light the Shadow. I like to keep them completely separate so then people don't um, view me differently. But I have a certain job in the community and um, my right. job is to look after the community as well, I'll say. And literally, it was like 30-odd youths um in a certain section of nottingham which is where i work and they just right. like harry potter hod walks they're just like freaking firing off fireworks left right and center like off the floor <laughs> they're going into cars and i'm just like oh my gosh and i'm by myself first time on a shift out by myself and i'm like oh shoot um but it was proper madness the fireworks were popping off and um i kept safe and i actually managed to um discourage them and split them up so i was quite pleased with that but mate uh fireworks are bit intense this week and it was on halloween i'm like aren't fireworks for november the fifth i didn't get it really but oh yeah but you remember when you were a lad mate any excuse to know for fireworks <laughs> that, that was my yeah, approach. Much cool. <laughs> yeah man that was my approach i just said look look i'm not here to have a dig or have a go at you i said look i'm just concerned about your safety like i get it i was i was a teenager and i'd, I'd try and have a laugh yeah. on that so yeah man but yeah um so if the fireworks go off don't worry lads we're doing our best and um, we'll crack on but sam mate for those who don't know you, um, uh, can you just basically share with the viewers um, what your profession is and, um, you know, of the last, uh, what were we at, 2020, so the last eight years or so particularly, um, what, where have you been and what you've done with your life? Yeah, so my name's Sam Oldham. I'm 27 years of age. I grew up in Keyworth, um, which is kind of, what are we, South Nottingham, and I've been doing gymnastics for 20 years. So when I was a kid, I was super hyperactive as a kid. Um, I could never sit still. So I'd jump from my, one of my mom's sofas to the other one. When I was at school, I was always that kid swinging on his chair. 
Uh, and I was getting into quite a bit of trouble and it was a school teacher that suggested to my mom she takes me along to the local gymnastics club. So that's when I first experienced gymnastics and it was pretty much, I fell in love straight away. Um, I was basically running around like a nutter and just not getting in trouble. Um, and, and a sport like gymnastics is very intense from a very young age. So, you know, I started with one session a week, then two sessions a week. And then before I knew it, I was training six days a week, two sessions a day. And I think by the age of probably about nine or 10, it was already very serious. So I was training around 40 hours a week at the age of nine or 10. Um, and, and it kind of just spiraled into me competing for Great Britain for the first time when I was 12 years old. Um, when I was 14, I actually left home and went to live down south for my gymnastics training. So I lived with another family at that age. Um, and then I was based out of Loughborough University for about eight years. And during that time, I competed at the London 2012 Olympic Games. Uh, so I was 19 at the time. Home games, competing for my country, you know, probably the biggest sporting event that this country's ever hosted. And um, yeah. yeah, I was part of the team that won Great Britain's first medal in men's gymnastics in 100 years. So it was a massive, massive achievement. Um, and it was kind of something that's really shaped me, I guess, as a person and as an adult for, for lots of different ways. Mm. Since then, um, I continued to improve. By the age of 21, I was probably one of the best talents in the world in gymnastics. I went into the Commonwealth Games in 2014 in Glasgow, expected to do incredibly well. Um, and I had a really bad injury, so I completely shattered my left ankle and essentially was told that my career might be over at that point. Uh, so I had reconstructive surgery on all of the ligaments in my ankle because I snapped all of them completely. Um, and then since then, it's been a bit of an uphill battle to get back mm. to where I was before. Um, and I've basically been stuck in a bit of a spiral of going in and out of injuries, trying to get back quicker, having another injury. And um, yeah, I guess where uh, I come in, in terms of the mental health stuff is that last year, I found myself in a real dark place um, around the summertime and I eventually ended up in therapy. So I went into therapy probably just over a year ago um, and I had therapy for about three months uh, for depression and anxiety. And yet now I guess uh, I'm someone that lives with that and is learning to manage it and deal with it and kind of accept it in a lot of ways. So I guess that's a quick fire um, answer to yeah, your question of a 20 year career. But that's kind of, yeah, I guess that's who I am in a nutshell. Right. I think that's uh, episode 19 packed to it. So <laughs> we're off. <laughs> well, yeah. nice one, mate. I appreciate that a lot. And um, I'm quite mindful of some of the episodes that we do because um, I like to like build it up usually, just naturally. Well, right, okay, um, yeah. No, no, but that's what I like. You've just gone straight in. So like <laughs> the viewers will be like, oh, shoot, this guy's like done stuff. He's been places. So yeah, man, I appreciate that. And um quite an uh, interesting time for everyone again this year um <clears throat> not to put off the viewers or anything but it's really important um that we don't avoid uh what's going on i think i think naturally mate that as blokes not all of us but a lot of us tend to just avoid things we kind of like push it aside we ignore yeah. it we man up we kind of get on with it so oh, no, it'd be all right but i actually feel like it's important that we don't dismiss this second lockdown um, for many reasons in terms of certain uh, things in our life, whether it's our mental health, our routine, mm -hmm. um, what we learned from maybe the first lockdown, wh wh which were positives, but then as life's picked up again, we've like kind of just forgot and then gone back to yeah. before the first lockdown. But yeah, man, um, you mentioned, you touched about your gymnastics, obviously a massive part of your week. Like, yeah. you know, um, did I, I just want to ask you firstly, did they ask, um, because ADHD and all that kind of thing, they, they give it and they, I feel like they overdiagnose young boys mm -hmm. who are just yeah. young boys and they want to yeah. be at it. So did, did they actually say to you like as a young lad, oh, I've I was, got ADHD or? Yeah, I was never diagnosed with it. I'd say I probably, there's a, probably a good chance I did have it. I mean, my family would always joke about when I was a kid, I used to sleep with my eyes open. I'd follow people around the room and I was just... I could never sit still, even now as an adult, as a 27 year old guy, if yeah. I walk down the street, I'm looking at the wall on the left of someone's front garden that I can jump on and climb across. <laughs> I've just always been that way. Um, I was always just getting into trouble. I wasn't, I wasn't a bad kid, I was just mischievous. And if someone would say, don't do that, my brain goes, I'm gonna oh, do yeah. it. Like I would try and push people's boundaries a little bit, I think. But um, yeah, I was definitely super independent 
a risk, definitely a risk taker. I was never kind of risk averse. Um, I, I, one thing I've learned, I'd say in the last couple of years is that I believe that the personality traits you have as a child stay with you for the rest of your life. Yeah. Um, it's just kind of the environment and the people that you're around that maybe nudge you in a certain way. But, you know, who Sam was when he was a kid is who I am right now. And for me, one of the biggest issues, I think, from touching on what you spoke about, about men just trying to shut it out, was I was in a female dominated sport from a very young age. So from a male gymnast, particularly when I started it, because it wasn't popular at all, um, we kind of everybody had a chip on their shoulder from the get go. You know, I wear I would wear a leotard and that for a, a lad that grows up in you know a school and a society where everybody pretty much just plays football rugby or cricket that's strange that's different kids don't like different people don't like different so yeah. that was definitely something that um, was drilled into me in terms of the man up type culture um, I always wanted to come across as tough I didn't want anyone telling me that I wasn't tough um, so I would like overstep that mark, you know, I would be quite aggressive, I'd say. Right. Um, definitely with my younger brother, like uh, brothers are terrible to each other anyway. But I, would always... I wouldn't mess with you, bro. I've seen some of your pictures of <laughs> yeah. looking in your gear and I'm like, yo, he's cut like all of them are. Well, that was the thing when I was when I was at school, like kids, if it was very rare they ever did, to be honest. But if kids ever gave me any shit, like as soon as I take my shirt off in PE and I had like a an eight pack as like an eight year old, that looks strange. That's like, whoa, people would soon shut up. Yeah. Um, and, and I think as actually, as I got older, people respected what I was doing. Um, you know, the kids at school would see me, I would get up at six in the morning, go to the gym and train, then turn up for my first lesson, absolutely knackered, then go and train after school. Then if I had homework, I'd have homework to do. So, you know, I think actually kids were seeing what I was doing, they would respect it, but there was definitely, um, there was definitely, like I said, that chip on the shoulder and uh, the, it, you might have seen, I don't know whether you have recently, there's been a lot that's come out in the, in the media and the press about gymnastics and a lot of abuse and misconduct. Yes. Um, I actually spoke about that recently myself. So independently, I put a video out there on Instagram uh, and talked about uh, a lot of gymnasts that I've known, a lot of teammates, a lot of girls, a lot of guys as well kind of spoke about different topics and I actually came at it from a mental health point of view. Yeah. Um, so when I was younger and um, like I said, gymnastics, we weren't doing very well. So we were ranked about 23rd in the world when I was uh, a kid. So at the Athens Olympic Games, we didn't qualify anyone uh, to compete at the Olympic Games for the men's team. Yeah. All of our senior guys had full-time jobs. So they were like firemen and bricklayers. It was just a hobby to do gymnastics. So there was no career path. Um, and, and that was that was very difficult as a kid getting into a sport where you couldn't really be a professional. It was kind of like, well, how long are you going to continue doing this before you have to kind of get a real job? And that was kind of the view yeah. from even a lot of the lads' parents that I would train with. They kind of they thought that we were just joking around and larking around. And when we get 16, you know, you're going to get a real job or whatever. So uh, I was very lucky that my parents were super helpful with that. Um, but going into like the London 2012 games, we started to get a lot of support from um, like the EIS, which are the English Institute of Sport. So we would get physiotherapy, we'd have doctors, we'd have nutritionists, wow. we'd have strength and conditioning coaches. But uh, the one thing that was always taboo was the sports psychologist. So back in that period of time, around 2012, kind of the whole idea was if you go and see a sports psych, there's something wrong with you and you're not going to get selected for the team. So no one would ever go and wow. see the sports psychologist. So most of the time, they'd just sit in the gym by themselves. They'd never have any kind of direct contact with any of the athletes. And that was pretty much the same across the board. Um, and, and people are shocked at that. Uh, but when I was a kid, actually, the kind of the general, I guess, say the general rule was you don't go and see a physio or a doctor because they'll stop you training. That was from a physical point of view. Yeah. yeah. So if you go and see the doctor and the physio, the doctor and the, a physio, they're going to stop you training. You won't be able to compete. So don't go and see them if you're injured. So you can imagine what the approach was to go and see someone to talk about your brain. It was your week, and you're not going to get selected for the team. Yeah. Um, so it's been a, it's been a real ongoing process to try and shift that dial a little bit and make it more almost more normal and I think with the likes of people like Tyson Fury coming out who's a heavyweight champion Massive, of the world talking it? about mental health issues it's definitely helped 
Um, there's a long way to go, but uh, for me, with that scandal that's come out recently in gymnastics, yeah. I took the opportunity to come from it from a mental health point of view. And essentially, uh, 2019, in January 2019, you have profiling when you're in any of the Olympic sports. So they will do a physical check, a psych evaluation, you have blood tests. And during my psych evaluation, I said, I'm really struggling here. Uh, I think I need some help. I think it will make a big difference. Uh, and actually, they British Gymnastics, who uh, are kind of like in charge of the team, they turned around and said, we're only helping the top five guys in the team now. We can't help you out. And subsequently, six months later, I find myself in therapy. So I came out and spoke about that. Um, and there was obviously a lot of the media attention around that. Uh, because it was at a time when there was gymnastics was all over the news. I was getting yeah. the BBC, ITV and Sky calling me every single day trying to get a story. And I said, uh, if I'm going to talk, it's going to be independently because I want to be in, completely in control of that narrative. And I made a video where I spoke about my circumstances. But for me, it wasn't really about uh, kind of. I wasn't going after people. No, no. It wasn't a witch hunt. I would genuinely wanted to try and help the situation and make sure that any of the younger athletes coming up don't face a similar situation to the one that I did. Um, so, yeah, I guess that's kind of how I, I, I've tried to tell you, a, I've gone about it. Yeah, yeah. And I've gone kind of around the houses there, but that kind of gives yeah, you an idea cool. of why maybe I ended up in the place I did and how it kind of reflects on the uh manning up and being tough and not talking about your problems yeah man I trying to put it to the back of your mind i feel like society it goes through like like do you know how we have periods like the renaissance period and you know the middle ages and and i feel fi i feel like we're coming we're, we're just we're crossing over um from this old mentality that says um just bottle it up and get yeah. on with it and I, I feel like we were programmed i feel like genuinely i think the age of institutionalization and programming. It, I, th I think that's one of the big things that's happening in the world across lots of um, spheres right now. And I feel like that's why there's a lot of chaos going on mm -hmm. in the media, with politics, with uh, people grouping, when we group people. I, I think there's so much chaos because people are like trying to liberate, people are trying to break free, pre people are trying to identify with themselves, um, find their identity, find purpose. And like it's this one big crop pot right now in the world and i feel like mm -hmm. things feel a bit crazy with covid and like it's important that we talk but um you're only going to find calm in the storm when you truly provide um a future where it's all right to chat it's all right to say no nah, i'm not good and then yeah. it not i think the key for this for blokes is it's not made to be out a massive deal like it's a deal where people are listening to you like truly mm -hmm. listening and saying yeah wow, um, I never realized that. And what can we do to help you? Um, that kind of listening, not, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, I understand, but they don't. Yeah. Um, but I just want, I, I just love, it's what I love about this, what we're transferring into is like with men's mental health, we're, we're not making a big deal out of it, but we're actually having to put a stake in the ground like you made, brother. I want to say um, big up to you for actually being the one to stand up. And I, I, I can see through your heart, you weren't out there to, slag off british gymnastics you were you were there to say look um there's something missing here and i've i've struggled and this i don't want this for anyone else um yeah. so yeah man I, I i love how you've done that and it's breaking free from this program and it's breaking free from this institutionalized view that men they have to be this this way all the time and i think men are slowly starting to see that but as you said before i think we went on camera that we've got a long way to go um yeah. And I just hope men are plugging into this now today. And I really hope that they start kind of analyzing their own life and where their head's at and not just, yeah. Going, oh yeah, my head's a mess. And they go on a freaking bender and do Coke or um, go on a mad one, but like yeah. they truly sit down and analyze things. And but that's scary, right? That's, that's scary. Terrifying. That's yeah. scary. But my, he won't mind me. He won't mind me talking about this, but my little brother, he, um, he went out to Australia back in February. So he actually went on my birthday, which was quite strange. He's my best friend, my little brother. He got offered a chance to go and play football out in Australia. He played the first game and then they got put into lockdown and he was basically isolated on a ranch by himself for about four or five months, just on his own. Now, my brother's told me in the past that the thing he's scared of the most is being by himself. So what my brother would do previously 
he'd go out on a Friday, a Saturday, and a Sunday because he just wanted to be around people. He was scared of that time inside his own head because that's quite daunting for people. And I completely get that. You know, there, there was times when, when my brother was doing that and, and we shared a house and I'd be in there on a Saturday night, I'd be in my room crying because I was really lonely. You know, and, was, and loneliness is a thing. Loneliness is a feeling. Now that might have been also depression, anxiety at the same time. I didn't quite understand what that was, but you know, I can completely get that. I completely get that feeling of not wanting to be inside your head and going out and drinking and whether it's, I've got, I've got to the age now and I'm sure you have where you've got friends or you've come across people that have had issues with whether it's drink, drugs, gambling, yeah. smoking, whatever it is, it's a vice. And I think for me, one thing I think is quite important is that because I was an athlete, okay, I'm more educated on what that will do to your body. And also I can't do it because I'm trying to perform at a super high level. Mm. But I used to think I was better than those people because I would say to myself, yeah, but you've not turned to drink or drugs or gambling. But what I was doing was just as destructive because the noise inside my head, what I was, the way I would think about myself and the way I was talking to myself mm. was just completely destructive. It was very negative. You know, I had a very low self-worth. Uh, my confidence was super low. And um, yeah, it was. I, I completely understand those people that... Um, yeah, we'll go out and they'll search for that escape. Um, but it, it is almost, you need that time to be by yourself. Uh, but for me, the, the talking thing is massive. It's huge. It's so, so important, but it's so difficult to do. You can't just tell someone to talk. No. There's been times even, there's been time, there were times in the first lockdown where I sat there on the edge of my bed crying, yeah, trying to force myself to pick up the phone and ring my girlfriend and tell her, it's, I've got it again, it's creeped up on me. I feel like that was so hard. It felt like the hardest thing in the world to do. But every time I did that, and every time I've done that, it gets just a little bit easier to do it again the next time. Uh, but, it, but it's tough, man, it, that's really hard. And you have to, I think you have to get to a place. Sometimes a lot of people, I, I almost think I have to get to a place where they hit rock bottom to be able to get out of it. Yes. Um, I don't know how you feel about that, but for me and my experience and kind of the experience I've had with some of my friends, some of my ex-teammates that maybe are dealing with alcohol or drugs or whatever that might be, you've got to realise that you're in a hole and you've got to want to get help because mm. otherwise it doesn't matter what someone says to you. You can, you can shout at them, you can give them love, you can take them to a therapist, but unless they want to get better, they're not going to get better. And I think that first thing of opening up and talking and just getting it out of your head into the world so is a good. big, big step. It's a hard thing to do. I'm not 100% sure I know exactly how to do that. But one thing I do know is that when I was at my worst last year, the best parts of my day were when maybe a, someone that I knew would say, how are you doing? And we'd had a little 30 second conversation. I get a little bit of a buzz. I feel good because I've t spoken to someone. And then five minutes later, I'd go back into that hole and I'd feel awful but that little conversation that little buzz was the highlight of my day so I know that there's something to talking to people and I think what's been so difficult about the lockdown situation is it's great right we can do things on zoom but yeah. it's not like seeing someone it's face to face same. you don't get the same feedback of someone you can't really tell if your best mate is in a good place or not because you're not there with them yeah and I think we feed off energy quite a lot so um, yeah, it, it's been t it's been difficult these lockdowns for for everyone I think but like you said I think the difference this time has probably been that the first time we were told it was going to be two weeks and then four weeks and then six weeks and then it carried on but we had no idea what was happening going into it this time we knew what it was like so I don't know about you but I noticed like an edginess to people for a, for a good few days before we went into it people were a little more stressed a bit more, yeah. more kind of like just a bit more on edge, I think, because everyone knew what was coming. Um, yeah. And so, but I think also people have learned what worked the last time around for me, what didn't work so well. And yeah, there's a lot definitely. more helpful information out there. Um, but doing things like this and your, you know, Enlighten the Shadows is great because it, um, it highlights the topic and it does need more. It needs that. It just needs that from wherever it can get it. Um, because a lot of the time in the media at the minute, you know, it's just fear mongering. Yeah, and sometimes you need to switch that off and stuff like this is really good you know it's great so um yeah i, could, I couldn't agree with you more in every way like i'm loving what you're saying massively and then you just freaking put the cherry on the cake like with the media like so much fear mongering yes it's all real yes but it's like 
this that connectivity and we talked about this in the last episode 18 with michelle briggs about yeah. um loneliness and she said like um you know this so sorry about the, the team leads you're probably not a fan but oh you're uh, a united fan mate oh we're it's just getting on so well <laughs> so she said like this cup um she she said this is um our lives and um this is like how much um we need connection and if we're missing that much like that's how much we're missing to feel that connection with people yeah. she said it beautifully so fellas <laughs> so yeah go and go, in. Go, and, go and look at the episode <laughs> yeah after this one don't yeah. do it now wait to the end yeah. After this one, you've got, I'm telling you, for the next three and a half, four weeks, check out episode 18, Michelle Briggs, because she explained um, loneliness and the need that w- we have a void to, to be needed. And then she talked about how being connected is the key to the answer of being lonely and find out ways to do that. And I know we're frustrated. I know we're all zoomed out, but um, we, we've got two choices, ultimately. And this is, this is exactly what Sam said just a minute ago, beautifully. He said how he got to the darkest and the lowest point and you know you can have all the all the love and all the encouragement in loads of plethora of ways but it, until you come to that acceptance until you go yeah you, you're self-aware saying shoot man and you got to draw the line in the sand and i say this not to dig you out not to be aggressive it's just we've got to as men there is a sense where we've got to be men and that's that's the true masculinity and it is right my back's against the wall i feel like crap I feel depressed. I feel suicidal. I feel this. Yes, you feel it. And that's so real, but that can't dictate your whole life for the rest of your life. I, and I'll say that to all of you. I, I'm telling you now, I'm getting all passionate, but I refuse to allow that in your life. Like you've got, you've got to fight, man. Like there's some of you who are watching this and you want to quit. Trust me, this guy here and this guy here, we, we have wanted to quit many, many times. And I wanted to quit this year after I've all the, the grievances that's how in like the shadow side because i came to the point fellas where i thought it's either going to go this way or this way it's either going to be there's no point and there's that hopelessness and and, and it could and it could lead to suicide or we we freaking we put pull up our boots and say yeah i am feeling this way it take it's going to take time i need to process it i need the help i need to talk but i've got to go the better way and so i'm saying to you fellas in this lockdown don't bury yourself please for your, for your sake not for me not for sam don't bury yourself in the sand and uh, and just like go to um i'm going to call it elijah mode I, you know i'm not a preach but in the bible there's this geezer called elijah and he and he felt he felt um, terrified of his life and he he struggled with his mental health and he hid in the cave to self-preserve and he hid from god he hid from everyone and this man was a beast he's like sam he's got purpose and identity he's got a world to set free and like me and, but yet he got discouraged, he got downhearted, he got isolated and he, he just more and more isolated himself and hit himself to the point where he actually told God, I want to end my life and all this. So I'm just telling you, there's many men who have gone before us and many will in the future who will go through what we're all feeling, what Sam said beautifully and what I said. And I'm saying to you, like, don't give up, man. We're here for you. We're not the answer, but we're here for you whenever you're ready. So on that note, before I ramp too much more, Coming off on the screen right now, we've got um, our Facebook group. So this is a private group, fellas, and I'll plug it every week because this is massive. This is a safe place where we can say whatever the frick we want and no one's going to laugh. No one's going to dig you out. You're not going to freak out your family because they can't see it. So make sure you sign up to that. I'll put the um, on the screen. But yeah, sorry, Sam, I freaking went off on one. I That's right, mate. I your, loved it, man. I love your the passion. Fault. You got me all freaking... I love the passion, man. Yeah, man, you buzzed me off. not a fan of the Leeds United, though, mate. I do that every time I think. <laughs> <laughs> oh shoot! But yeah, man. Um, what I wanted to ask you, based on the the gymnastics, um, the power of routine. Um, I really feel like with these lockdowns and with our lives, and as I allude to the chaos, I'm just really um, mindful that uh, routine. And if it's if your routine's gone absolute boobies up, like what can you advise the importance and stressing the importance of routine just from your experience obviously they're not all freaking going to be sick at gymnastics like you but like what did you learn about how powerful routine is and then in terms of unlocking like excellence in your life and then improving your mental health 
Well, I'd say what I would say is in terms of the first lockdown. So my plan was to retire from gymnastics two weeks into the lockdown. So I had a competition. It was the British Championships. I'd arranged for a box for all my family and friends to go and watch me. I was going to compete one more time, wave, walk off into the sunset. And that was it. I was done. I was going to walk on, uh, move on to the next chapter of my life, really. Uh, lockdown hit. Uh, the world kind of just went into turmoil. The Olympics got cancelled. It was kind of like what, no one knew what was going to happen. Uh, but very, very quickly, I realised that I am going to need to train here Otherwise, I'm going to really struggle mentally. So I carried on training from the get go, but not for my gymnastics, literally for my mental health. Um, so it was the only thing I could really structure my day around. So I lost my job with British Gymnastics. So I essentially I lost my job, but I lost my place on the GB team um, in April last year. I ended up having to move in with my grandparents. Um, at the time, I didn't have a girlfriend. My relationships with my friends weren't so great. Yeah. Um, so I really, really struggled. Um, and going into that first lockdown, I knew that having that structure in the day was the only thing I was going to have. You know, I, like I said, I didn't have a job. Like I wasn't going to be able to work. Like most people, I was feeling pretty useless that I wasn't on the front line doing something and helping people. Um, and I was kind of at home doing gymnastics training in the garden, which is, you can't do that really. Like it's, there's not a lot you can do in your garden. And feeling like what the hell am I doing I'm doing cartwheels and handstands and working on a pommel mushroom and there's people out there on the front line you know putting their lives at risk it just but for my own mental health I knew that every day at 12 o'clock I was going to go and train for between an hour and a half to two hours two hours and a half every single day and then I would build my day around that so I'd wake up every morning I make my bed every morning so I wake up make my bed I go and have my breakfast I decided to take up gardening. So I built a, I actually built a vegetable box out of a, um, how would you call them? Like a crate, like a wooden crate, basically. Yeah. Um, so I used a wooden crate, pulled it all apart, made it all myself. It took me like four days. And then I started growing vegetables. So I go water my vegetables every single morning after I'd had my breakfast, sit down, do emails and stuff in the morning. Then I'd do, have a coffee at 11, do my gymnastics training. Then I'd maybe ring one of my mates and then throughout the week, I'd have anchors. So every week uh, I'd do a, a, a quiz, a Zoom quiz with my mates on a Wednesday night. And on a yeah. Thursday, I might do a catch up with one of my family members. I might walk the dog every day at like five. Actually, I did start walking the dog five, about five, six o'clock every single day. So I just made that. I forced that structure and routine yeah, yeah. because without that, I knew all I was going to be doing was spending time up here. Mm. And I think in the first two weeks of lockdown, my screen time on my mobile phone was up to eight hours. Ooh, fast. So I, I realized that yeah. I saw that and realized <clears throat> that's probably not healthy. Um, and I actually did a little study with a girl that I get a lot of people that reach out to me and say, Oh, can you take part in my uni dissertation and stuff? But this one was quite interesting. She was doing a study on mental health and social media and how that affects elite athletes. And she was doing it on behalf of, the IOC, so the International oh, Olympic wow. Committee. So I was like, oh, this is quite cool. I'll get involved with it. And so I monitored my social media use for a month and then kind of had an initial interview and then a post interview. Uh, and after that, I actually switched my social media usage. So uh, now I actually, I'm at like just under an hour most weeks on a day on my phone, which is a lot better than eight hours a day. Um, I actually, it was a friend of mine who um, I was running with during lockdown, he said that he deleted his social media during the week, Monday to Friday, downloaded it on a weekend. I was like, God, that's a great idea. I'm going to do it, but the opposite way around. So I'll do it Monday to Friday and delete it on the weekend. Um, so that had a real positive effect. And again, just meant that in my spare time, I wasn't jumping on Instagram and scrolling through it mindlessly. Uh, but just keeping that structure, like you said, was very, very important for me. But yeah. you know, I kind of had an advantage to everyone else because I've had that structure my whole life. My whole life has been about routine. My whole life has depended on what training session I'm doing the next day. So what time I go to bed the night before, what I eat, yeah. whether I go and see my friends, it was all dictated by the training the next day. So to have that taken away was pretty scary for me in the start of lockdown. You know, yeah. I'm used to training five or six hours a day and that's kind of my identity and my purpose is that. So when that was taken away from me, you know, it was a, it was a scary, scary moment for me uh, and that routine and structure definitely helped keep me in a good place yeah, uh, I wouldn't yeah. say it helped me completely avoid a lot of the issues I dipped in and out of depression and anxiety quite a lot during those first few months of lockdown 
Um, but what I would say is after I had my therapy last year and I finished my therapy, I kind of did a flip 180. And up until the lockdown, I hadn't had any issues and my life was brilliant. I had like rebuilt a lot of the relationships with my friends. They were really healthy. All the relationships I had with my family members were great. I had a, I had got a new girlfriend, which was brilliant. It had a real positive impact on my life. Um, I was actually going into primary schools and working with primary school kids doing gymnastics classes, which I loved doing. Um, and my training was kind of better than it's been in years. Uh, people were actually coming up to me saying, God, you look like you're 21. And I was like, I actually kind of feel like I'm 21. Yeah, so I was on. in this great place. But in the back of my mind, there was always this real deep concern that as quick as I'd turn everything around, it could go back the other way. And some, I didn't know what could kick that off, what would tip that off, whether it was, you know, if I suffered something really personal. Um, and that was always a real worry of mine. And the positive thing for me about lockdown was that it forced me to face that. Mm. I had to face the fact yeah. that all of the things that I put in place with my therapist uh, that I relied on to sort my mental health out for those four yeah. months post that were all taken away because it was all about me being in the community and feeling like I was having an impact. And like you said, spending time with friends, spending time with family, yeah. um, not getting too locked into training because that is one of my vices as well. I tend to overtrain, and I use training as a way to punish myself. Right. Um, so, so for me, it was a big control thing. So I, I had a real healthy balance to my life for the first time, and that all got taken away. Uh, so for me, that was really, really difficult in the lockdown. But, uh, mm -hmm. you know, coming out of the lockdown and going into the second one, I learned a lot. I put a post out today, and it was kind of about the five things that helped me the most during the first lockdown. And they're things that I'm going to implement definitely for this next month. Um, but the routine and structure, really, really important for everybody out there and guys out there. You know, I think I, I had a really interesting experience living with my granddad. Uh, I lived with my grandparents for 10 months and uh, probably about four months before I moved in with him, he had just retired. He retired at 79. So he was still climbing on roofs oh, and building at 79. He's an absolute character, my granddad. Um, but he didn't deal with retirement very well at all. He had a massive identity crisis. Mm. Uh, and I got to watch that unfold in an older man who's towards the end of his life. And I think that was very, very valuable for me because I'm at some point going to have to experience that as a young man. So yeah. I'm going to have to retire from gymnastics. And it's the only thing I've known, you know, my family members from the age of 10 or 11, would they wouldn't introduce me as Sam, they'd introduce me as the gymnast. Um, so I knew that that was coming and I got to watch that. Uh, and hopefully that will put me in good stead going into uh, this transition phase that I'm at now. You know, I'm yeah, getting yeah. close to retirement. It's coming up at some point, and I know that that's going to affect me mentally, really affect me mentally. Uh, I feel like I'm prepared for that. Uh, right. Definitely, I'd say that the structure thing is super important, uh, and, and lockdowns taught me a lot about myself. Um, definitely taught me a lot about myself. But it's tricky. It's tricky, like you said. I think the biggest thing for me, I think you mentioned it. I don't know whether this is the case with you, um, but I'm really, I hide from the world. I hibernate. When I get low, I pull myself away. So um, I'll stop talking to friends and I'll stop going to meet friends for things. I'll go into my own room and stay in my bedroom. I'll, I'll just start to pull away from the world. One of the little things that I do that I actually noticed in the last few weeks, because my mental health went a little bit down the drain a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Um, was that when I train in the gym, I would I put my headphones in for when I warm up. And because I'm an older guy now in the gym and most of the guys are like young spring chickens, I'll warm up for an hour to an hour and a half. And I'll put my headphones in and listen to a podcast. But actually when I do that, it's when I don't want people to talk. It's a signal it's telling people to stay, stay away. away. I want to be inside my own head. Uh, and the last three days of this week, that I was able to train Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, I made a little rule for myself no headphones when you're warming up, be open. And if people come, they can have a conversation to you and you kind of feel then connected to the world. Like um, so yeah, for me, definitely I pull myself away. Um, I'm very lucky now that I've been so open with people around me and that are close to me during this whole process that I now have people in kind of each circle of my life that can recognize when I'm falling into that place. Now, the, the, the tricky thing for me is that I still don't understand it myself. So yeah. I know when I'm really good and I know when I'm really bad, but that small transition phase where I'm going from being fine to spiraling out of control, Very it's not necessarily out of control anymore. I can't notice it. There's a lag. 
So someone else, like my girlfriend, will say, are you okay? You seem quiet and a little distant. And I'm like, no, what are you talking about? I'm fine. Like, it's all good. And then three or four days later, I'll realize, ah, crap, I'm in that hole. The anxiety is yeah, coming yeah. Back. So at the minute, I'm trying to figure that out. And it's all about self-awareness and experience and Definitely, learning. Man. But um, I think, yeah, like I completely understand people taking themselves away from the world because that's what I've done most of my adult yeah. life, to be honest with you. But it, as you said, rightfully, <clears throat> it's very subtle. Like you don't notice it. And, you know, well, I got all passionate earlier saying about, you know, retrieving and burying your head in the sand. But by that point, when most blokes realize it's too late. Um, yeah. So, yeah, that's that's an absolute nugget right there is trying to identify individually because we're all so unique. Where is the point and what are the triggers? Because I think that might be the key. Where, what, what or who are the triggers yeah. that is enabling us to cross over where our, our mental health and mental health is a good thing it's not all oh, bad we can have yeah. good mental health we can have ill mental health where we start to dip and it's like that that exchange isn't it where where and what and who is it that and that enables us to start to dip but then helping us to recognize it and then snap out of it so then we we go out the other way it's written it's so like i think that oh gosh if we had the answer for that the world would <laughs> the yeah. world would be a peaceful place at all to... <laughs> you're right mate you're right I, I think it's tough and i think one thing i'd want to stress to people is that if you're in a similar position in terms of you know you might have been dealing with these issues for 12 months 18 months and you're still learning to figure it out and you're managing it because i'm sure there's a lot of people that are in that position and it's kind of a it comes and it goes um one thing for me during lockdown i would get really frustrated initially when the anxiety and depression would come back i get really angry with myself because i felt like a science experiment i was like i've got to do all, i've got to try so hard at being okay and i need to put mm. i need to put things in place almost like i'm treating myself like a machine like i need to do this and this and this just to be okay and it'd feel like a failure every time that the anxiety came back and the depression and I would start to count the time between when I felt good and I'd be like, oh, it's two weeks. I need to keep going. Like, and every time I come, it feel like a failure. And, and to an extent, I've been doing that anyway recently as well. I'd it been going on for so long that I felt good. I was like, oh, God, it's like two months now that I've not felt yeah. like that. Oh, three months. But then again, I'm putting a number on it. I'm putting a number on it. And um, what I, what's happened now recently, I'd say in the last two or three times that I've had it is that instead of getting frustrated, I look at it now. Oh, wow. I went six weeks this time. I went six yeah, yeah. weeks and I noticed a little bit quicker. Maybe next time I'll go eight weeks and that'd be great. And then maybe next time I'll go three months and then maybe six months. And then maybe one day, you know, I might be all right, yeah. it, but it might come back, but at least I'll know how to manage it. I'll know what I need to do, what I need to do to kind of what I need to put in place to get me out of that kind of mm. funk that I'm in. But, the really important thing for me was that I've been trying, I've tried to be so open with the people around me because it feels like then I've got people on my team. If yeah. someone's completely aware of where I'm at mentally, I think the one of the hardest things to possibly do is to talk to the people close to you because you don't want to burden them. You don't want to burden. I don't want to go to my girlfriend and, you know, she's got, she's got shit of her own man every it's important to know that everyone's got their own shit and everyone's got stuff going on that you never know about and but the worst the worst thing to do is to just keep it inside you know when i when I, the, that first period when i realized there was something wrong with me in the space of a week I, I, let's i'll go through it so i lost my job in the april and at that point i was thinking what the hell am i going to do i've been on the gb program since i was eight years old i was 26 at the time and then i was just cut off boom gone um and so i'm having a massive like kind of almost identity crisis at the time do you know what i mean thinking like god what the hell am i going to do do i need to get a job like what's going on and what i did yeah. was i made myself as busy as i possibly could i took on things left right and center just so i wasn't spending time inside my head um and i just burnt out uh, eventually and a couple of times I noticed uh, during a period of about two months that I was very numb. I was very numb to things. So there were some good things happening in my life and some bad things, but it wasn't really making me feel anything. And I can remember wow. thinking, that's a bit strange, but I just carried on with what I was doing. And then there was a period of a week where I went to see a teammate of mine, super high level guy. Um, I've known him since he was eight years old. I kind of grown up with him, almost like took him under my wing, younger brother type thing. And he was in a really, really bad place, a really dark place. 
and it kind of shone a light on myself I think and that's why I was so affected by it I can remember going back to my own gym because I spent two days with him and I just had this rant with my coach for like two hours I was shouting and getting really passionate and angry and I said it's terrible what's happened to him no one's looking after him uh and and then two days later there was an accident in my dad's work so um, my mom came and knocked on my, I was living with my grandparents, came and knocked on the door and I could tell straight away, I saw her face and I knew, so I was like, what is it? And basically a guy had fell off a roof, hit his head and my brother had saved his life essentially. Um, and he'd nearly died and he was put into a coma. Um, fortunately he's okay now, but it was very traumatic for my brother and my dad and the whole family. And the next day after that, my coach who has coached me since 2001. So this guy has spent six hours a day, six days a week with me for 20 years. So I spent more time with him growing up than I did my parents. I was, I was lucky. I almost had like an extra dad, Uh, but he went into hospital with kidney stones and he doesn't really have any family. So I was driving to the hospital every day to see him because no one else could do it. His wife doesn't drive. She's Russian. She's only been over here for a couple of years. So within the space of three days, I lost all of the people I go to for advice. And I'm the type of person that in my circle, everybody comes to me for advice because when I'm in a good spot, I'm very good at giving people logical advice that makes sense. Yeah. But I lost all of my people. And instead of going to share it with someone, I didn't want to burden them. I didn't want to burden my coach in hospital, not dealing very well with kidney stones. He was in there for a while. He was very ill. I didn't want to go to my dad because of all the stress of work. I didn't want to go to my brother because of what he's just been through. I didn't want to, you know, I couldn't go to my ex teammates. So I just kept that all inside me. And uh, the numb phase went away. And what came next was anger and aggression and uh, just sadness, just crying for no reason. But I'd be in the gym and I'd be shouting and getting frustrated and swearing. And that carried on for a couple of weeks. And it just got to the point where my body had also deteriorated at this point. I really believe that your mental health and your body are interconnected. Absolutely. Um, And when you're in a bad place here, you know you've seen it how many people spiral out of control physically when they're just not in a good mental space and they're stressed and for me i carry stress in my neck it's in my neck and i had a nerve issue in my neck that was literally i couldn't put a seatbelt on i couldn't clap my hands and i was trying to do gymnastics so it just got completely overwhelming and i actually was in the gym i broke down and i said sergey this is my coach he had just come back to the gym said i think i need to stop what i'm doing i need to stop everything i don't know what's wrong with me but this feels dangerous and I, I just need to stop. I need to go away. And um, after that, uh, I was really upset. I cried for a while and he said, that's fine. Like take 10, 15 days off, whatever you need. Cause he could obviously see that I was very distressed. Um, and I drove back to my mom's house and she was in the garden. It was a sunny day. Went out a conversation with my mom and God, we were both just crying our eyes out. Mm. Um, and, and I actually, the next night, um, again saying you either kind of you hide yourself away or you want to escape right so I booked a flight to Barcelona and just ran away to Barcelona for four days um don't know really why I did it I wasn't in the right frame of mind I didn't tell anybody I got to Barcelona and texted my mom and said mom I'm in Spain I'm gonna be here for a few days I'm okay I'll see you on Sunday for Sunday dinner and I'll come back and um yeah i didn't have a hotel or anything i literally turned up in barcelona found a hostel stayed there for four days and i actually it was really weird it was a a time where i didn't want to be alone but i needed to be on my own to kind of figure a few things out kind of get clear and be in a completely different place and i it's really sad when i look back now it's really sad i spent four days in barcelona and i can only remember talking to uh someone at a coffee shop ordering a coffee and probably uh someone at the airport that was it i didn't speak to anyone for four days i'd go to the hostel and then i'd go out and do things in the day um but <laughs> yeah it was crazy like time, i was just lost i was so lost you know mm-hmm. and it wasn't until i got back from that i went to see a doctor that had known me since i was probably about 14 15 so i trusted her and i went to see her about my neck and i was seeing her she could obviously see that i was a bit distressed um and i said to her on the way out i was leaving and she organized a scan for my neck yeah. And my scanner, I said, Kate, do you think uh, that if I'm under stress, it might be affecting my neck? And she said, yeah, of course. Like a lot of people deal with stress in different ways. Some people it goes in their back, some people their skin, some people their neck. And she said, you know, that I can help you with not just the physical things. You know, I can support you with the mental side of things as well. And I was like, okay, she was like, would you be happy to fill a form out? 
And I was like, yeah, okay. Like I, I had opened up to for about 10 minutes and I started filling out this form. It was just like a yes, no type tip box thing. And I realized as I was writing it down in ink, every answer was like, but it was the wrong answer. That I shouldn't have been writing that answer. And it was every single one. Yeah. I got to the end and it was like, yeah, there's something wrong. There's something wrong with me here. And um, yeah, eventually I got put into, I got, it got arranged for me to end up in going into therapy. Um, uh, but it was a bit of a lag between that session seeing the doctor and therapy because I actually tried to avoid that for a long time. I, yeah, yeah. You know, I yeah, tried. To, uh, there was a there was a slot on the Thursday afternoon, but that was when I trained, and I was like, I can't miss my training, so I need to be in the gym. And then it wasn't for a few more weeks where I just felt like the same, and I I just went, Do you know what, this is more important. I'm gonna try it and give it a go. And then I went that's into good. the therapy. Oh, mate, that's class. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I just want to say um, I massively respect you so much. Like I've I've not met you before. Um, I just respect you so much for um, being so real and open um, to, to our viewers. And it's, it's absolutely marvelous um, to help them realize, yeah, man, he's been an elite gymnast. You know, he's gone to Olympics. Yeah. How can I relate to him in any way whatsoever? And they think totally unrelatable. And this is why I really hope and pray that when people watch in like Michelle's episode, they, they really lean in and like watch them because they realize we're all of us blokes are more in common than we realize i'm but. just a normal lad man yeah just, exactly that's and that's I why am. that's the vibe i get from you so like <clears throat> yeah. i've i've had about three or four quite high profile people um in the 20 summit episodes we've been doing in total um but i don't i don't feel like that nervousness at all because you're like oh my gosh he, he's a freaking 2012 medalist like oh like it, there's nothing of that aura you're just so um, humble and um, you've got a bit about you and uh, before I ask you that I enlighten the shadows question I want to say sure. I want to say a word of encouragement to you personally on camera and I don't think I've done this before but I feel it in my heart um, sorry if this gets a bit emotional but um, um, your time is not over um, yes I just I get the words your time is not over and all of your all all of your triumphs and all of your miseries are bottled up as a collection as part of your tapestry and your story so that you could enable others to be set free and walk um, and achieve just as much as you have achieved, but with less pain. Um, yeah, I, be I believe everything you have, uh, have experienced is not wasted. And I, I sense that um, it will all start to make sense soon. Um, yeah. When the soon is, I don't know, but I, I want to say to you and to encourage you, it will all start to slowly make sense to you and you will learn um, the beauty of something I, I learned from this guy who lost a few wives and children through uh, fevers. Um, he was a missionary and he said at the, bo the bottom of the cup of bitterness, he found a sweet taste. And I, and I believe in your journey with your mental health, it, and I say this to some viewers, I think some viewers might relate to this, but this is to you particularly. At the bottom of, your, of the cup of your bitterness and suffering, you'll find sweetness. And um, that will enable you to find that identity and purpose that, yeah. that you're trying to, that I sense you're anxious about because you're transitioning now from the yeah. gymnastics, but the gymnastics is still you. Like it's not, yeah. oh, it's finished. That is part of you and that's your story. So I want to encourage you uh, on, this, on this episode live. Like I, I've never done this before, but I, um, I get this uh, encouragement in my heart. I want to give that to you and bless you, man. I think um, it's, it's all going to be great for you. Um, it doesn't feel that way. It seems very gray right now for you, but I'm telling you, bro, you've, Thanks, you've got so much in you to, uh, to give at the right time and it will come. So, yeah. Really appreciate that, mate. That means yeah, a lot. Thanks for that, man. Yeah, yeah man. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, come on. Been yeah. in the love. Right. So um, before we close uh, this episode, yeah. um, that we will have our Enlighten the Shadows question and we, we try to use this um, on a, every episode. So uh, just for anyone who has made it this far, hopefully they have, um, just they feel utterly hopeless and they just want to end it all. Um, can you give us one short piece of advice for them? Yeah, I'd say, I'll try and be short, mate. What I would say, <laughs> so these people can like connect to me. For me, I, I got pretty much as low as you could go. And uh, last year, um, when I first really suffered mental health issues, like deeply, uh, I didn't want to wake up in the morning and I just wanted to go to sleep at night because I wanted the pain to go away. Um, this year into the lockdown, it got to the point where um, 
it's really hard to explain to people you love, right? That um, you can be happy, but also feel this pain. That's the last six months have been the best in my life since I met my girlfriend. It's been amazing. But that, that pain, that pain is a very real thing. You feel it there. Um, and, and for me, I think the, the one piece of advice I'd give someone is that every day you get a new chance to start again. You get a chance every single day. You get a new chance to write that book. And it gets better. It honestly gets better. And it's temporary. That's the one thing I'm learning about my mental health issues that now I've, I've gone through it more and more. I realize that it's just a temporary phase. As much as when I feel super high is a temporary phase, when I feel super low, it's just a temporary phase. And I will get through that. Um, and, and for everyone at home, it's the same thing. You, you'll get through that. So hang in there. Uh, but you are important, man. You're important. And um, I think being able to learn to love yourself is very, very important if you're struggling. Um, and try and look for the little things. Look for the little things. Look for the beauty in the little things, man. A cup of tea in the morning. Oh, oh. enjoy it. Take it all in. Do you know what oh, I mean? A cold what's beer. Your huh? what's, your, what's your brew? Tell me well, what you're honest with you, I've only been, I've only just started drinking tea. I'm a big coffee guy. Yeah. But I'm having Earl Grey's. I quite like them. I drink them black. Um, so I have one of them in the evening with uh, a bit of, with like a biscuit or something, but just things like that. Do you know what I yeah, mean? Man. Just appreciate the small things. I'm um, a Yorkshire tea lad. It's got to have it quite Yorkshire, strong. Yorkshire, Yorkshire. Li Yorkshire. Little bit, little bit of milk <laughs> yeah. and one sugar. Okay. Sugar. The Demara sugar. Pot. Yeah, Cut that sugar out, mate. Not good for your tags. <laughs> well, I used to, <laughs> <laughs> I used to, I used to have a white sugar and have two. Okay. So yeah. I've gone down a sugar and I've gone for natural demaro whatever it's called sugar so okay, yeah, yeah. i'm on a journey bro i'm on a journey yeah but i would say i really would say that mate like every every day you get a chance to start again you can be who you want to be Massive. i think one thing that people don't understand is and this is really tough right so trying to tell someone just to be positive doesn't work like that you can't just be positive but it is a choice and the choice is you've got to choose to find the positives in things it ain't easy being positive is hard work it's hard work to wake up every day on a miserable morning when the world is like it is and to go, do you know what? I'm going to have a good day today. <laughs> this is going to be a good day. I'm going to make it a good day. That's a hard thing to get your head around. Uh, and it's not going to be an overnight thing. And you'll go through phases of being able to do it and maybe not being able to do it. Um, but but I, I think that's the biggest one. And for me, giving myself a break, just give yourself a break, man. Give yourself a break. And it's, and it's not selfish to look after yourself. I used to think, right. I used to, think looking after yourself was a selfish trait. I used to kind of despise it in a way. Um, and it would be all about, for me, it was kind of trying to find value in just, I, I just give my time to so, so many other people. But one of the quotes that I always use when I'm talking about mental health is, you know, when you get on an airplane and you, they're going through that little thing at the start, the emergency landing, and they say, make sure you put your own oxygen mask on first before you oh. put it on your children. And that's right. If you don't help yourself, and you're not in a good place, you can't help anyone. So make that's sure you so take true. care of yourself first, and then you can help other people. And that's what I find for me when I'm looking after myself, I'm way better. I'm, yeah, it. great. I can help you. I can give you loads, loads of advice. And, you know, I'm here to support you. But if I'm not in a good place, I'm no help to anyone. So yeah. definitely do that. And then the biggest one for me, a problem shared is a problem halved. So always remember. Right. Before we close, because we're about to close, did Blaine get that from you? Because... I don't know, he might have. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. He might have. <laughs> because basically, um, we revealed him on last week's episode, special right, episode yeah. six. So our special episodes we do every three weeks. Um, yeah. And it's the Enlightened Lads. Like we, we just have a chilled podcast where it's not yeah. someone's life story or it doesn't go yeah, too yeah. deep. Um, yeah. It's just, yeah, a bit chill for people. And he, on, on his episode uh, 17, he was like, yeah, problem shares, a problem hard. And I was just like, that is amazing. We proper like was like, you need to trademark that. And I'm like, hold on a bit. I think I have, like, like, I have been saying it for a long time, mate. Like I put it out there on Instagram. I'm sure he follows me on Instagram. So yeah. But yeah. it's cool. He can have it. It's Blaine's. It's fine. Yeah, brother. But it doesn't matter, mate. It's just getting that message, like you said, yeah. out to people. You know, you've got to get it out to, to young men. Like it's okay. It's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to That's feel right, weak. Man. It's fine, man. It's fine. Like I've just realized, I, I've realized recently I'm such an emotional guy. Like Me I cry too, a lot and I yeah. used to try and suppress that. You know, I used to try and, like I said, be strong, be weak. The sport that I was in, I was told to never smile, mm. never have a good time. Like, 
and all I was doing was just suppressing myself. And yeah. I realized with the identity thing, like the advice you gave me, that's really, really helpful. It means a lot to me. Yeah. And one thing I have realized is that um, gymnastics is just the way I chose to express myself. I could have been a bricklayer or yeah. a footballer. It doesn't matter. I am me. This is the personality of me is who I am. Gymnastics is the way that I express myself and do something that I love. So yeah. I know going into the next stage of my life, I'll be fine. You will, mate. You will. Absolutely. You will. Yeah. Oh, bro, it's been sick. And um, yeah, just if you can, just make sure you, you plug this episode. It's um, it's going to be a, a big one for people, I think. And uh, yeah, um, I just have a feeling and I, I don't want to get too excited. I say this to, to some blokes, like I have a feeling this won't be like the last goodbye for from yourself. Like I feel like um, we can talk at, off camera and we'll talk to the enlightened lads um, and just talk more about this because, you know, and I always say that, um, more hands is, is lighter work and everyone's got something to give and um you're passionate about this kind of thing in life so yeah man we'll, we'll talk more for sure i think in the future but um just on behalf of myself and the viewers we're, we're very blessed and grateful you came on man um so, so yeah guys this has been episode 19 with sam oldham uh and actually you're the second oldham to come on because we did on episode uh 14 there's oldham does his own running uh thing in nottingham called do running it's sick so uh, so to viewers check that out but guys uh, before we say bye um, just very quickly uh, just a couple things so firstly come up on the screen right now is that big red button um, if you can just very quickly pause this video click the button subscribe and then set up a YouTube account it takes one minute bang smash it out we're nearly on the 100 club um, and it's not about oh look at me I've got 100 views no it's nothing to do with that it's about getting out further and further so we can reach more people. Um, more clout we got on YouTube, uh, the better for In Light the Shadows, the better for men's mental health. Um, and, and lastly, uh, on the social media side of things, so coming up on the screen right now, we've got uh, Twitter and Instagram. We're just gradually, steadily growing every week on these. We're very grateful for people following us so we can get that message out there. Um, so it's at Enlighten the SH1. Um, and Facebook, as I've said earlier in, in this chat tonight, uh, we said about the private Facebook group, get on Facebook, like our page, one click, that's all it takes. And then um, if you are struggling, if you relate to anything we have talked about tonight, Sam and I, uh, make sure you get on that private group chat. Um, just invite yourself, because we, we might have you on, on, on uh, Facebook and click on it and we'll gladly accept you. There's 10 rules that we got on there. It's just so we stay on topic and we keep people's information safe. But yeah, fellas, have an amazing week. Uh, we'll be back next week. We've got some amazing guests lined up still. Uh, we've got a young lad who's raised thousands of pounds for charities at a uh, place, fo Professional Football Academy. Um, so he's going to have some interesting stuff. And this, this young man is very, very switched on. So he's not to be underestimated for his young age. Um, and I'm trying to think of the other one, but I can't off the top of my head, so it's blessed. So guys, have a great week. Let's smash the granny out this lockdown too. Let's stick together and let's keep safe. All right, much love guys, bye.